Uh, it's uh, four o'clock. We're ready to start this webinar. And um, in order to be able to share the webinar with other people, we will also be recording this session uh, here, Andrea. We can start. Thank you, Liz. And welcome all. Thank you for joining to this webinar on DGroups, uh, Simple Solution for Building Online Communities. Here is what we plan uh, for today, how we plan to run this webinar. Uh, we'll have uh, a few uh, welcome slides, and then we'll start with a short introduction about DGroups, what it is, uh, who is behind it, and organization that are already, the organizations that are already using it. Uh, then we'll have three very interesting case studies about uh, uh, using DGroups to build online communities. And we plan to finish with uh, 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 an half an hour, 25 minutes to half an hour for conversations uh, to answer all the questions that you might have and make sure that by the end of the webinar you have a good understanding of what DGroups is, what it does, and how it could support you to build online communities. Well, I think it's important uh, that we have uh, some uh, um, housekeeping rules uh, to make sure that we have a productive meeting. Uh, we have a short amount of time. The total run time is about 60 minutes. So we'll make sure that uh, we keep uh, the allocated time for presentations and discussions. Um, we want to uh, make sure that we are brief uh, when we have comments or questions uh, that uh, will allow more people to participate, to join the conversation and the discussion bit. And as Alice said before, let's make use of the chat box. Uh, I see um, most of you are already doing that. So during the presentations, if there are questions that come to your mind, please make sure that you log them into the chat box so that we can pick them up when we uh, start uh, uh, the, the Q&A part, OK? Um, we will also enable voice, but uh, uh, in the meantime, please make sure that your questions are logged into the chat. Well, the webinar um, is uh, brought in partnership, uh, is hosted by FAO uh, in collaboration with DGroups. And Alisa, you have heard her voice before. Uh, she has been doing a terrific job uh, in promoting the webinar, handling the registration, and uh, supporting the webinar design. She's our host today, so she'll make, she'll make sure that uh, um, the webinar runs smoothly from a technical point of view. And she's also managing the public chat. As for myself, my name is Pierre Andrea Pirani from Euphoric Services. Uh, I'm also supporting the DGroups Foundation with communication and membership, membership relations. And I'll be your uh, process facilitators, facilitator for today. For today, we set up. We, have, we are lucky to have a great lineup of speakers. Um, they're going to present us what DGroups is, uh, and they're going to give us three very, very different and very exciting examples, case studies of how they've been using uh, DGroups in their work to support online communities. So first, we'll start with Saskia Harmsen from the Charter for Change Alliance and member of the DGroups board. Uh, Saskia will talk uh, um, about DGroups, uh, what it is, uh, and uh, uh, give us a, bit a quick introduction about, about it. Then we'll move to Suzanne Phillips. Um, she will be talking uh, about the FAO Global Farmer Field School platform, and how they've been using DGroups uh, as an additional tool to make sure that they can bring in all the different stakeholders into the discussion. Um, Next online, we'll have uh, Giacomo, Giacomo Rambaldi from CTA. He will be talking about drones for agriculture um, and how they've been using DGroups to carry out a mapping of existing laws and regulations governing, governing the use of drones uh, in various countries. Last but not least, uh, we'll have uh, Neil, Neil Pakeman Walsh. He is the coordinator of HIFA, Health Information for All, and he is the current chairman of DGroups. He will be presenting how DGroups has been used by the HIFA forums 
which bring together more than uh, 17,000 people from around 180 countries, if I recall correctly. So we ask our participants to, uh, ask, to answer three key questions in their case studies. What issues are you trying to solve with D-groups? How have you been used D-groups? How have you used D-groups? And why would you recommend D-groups to others? I think we're now ready to start, so uh, I'm handing over to Saskia, uh, Saskia Armsen, for a brief introduction on D-groups. Saskia, Saskia, the floor is yours. You've got about five minutes, five to seven minutes. I'll give you a warning if you're running out of time. Thank you very much, Pierre. And thanks for having me and giving me an opportunity to uh, talk about D-groups to this audience. Uh, just having briefly looked at the chat, I see there's a lot of people that are already very familiar with D-groups. Um, some might be a little less familiar of, or have heard about D-groups uh, just briefly, so I want to take just this opportunity to give you a little bit more information uh, and hope it's useful for you. Um, so when we tend to talk about D-groups, uh, it can be you know a, a lot of different things to different people. We tend to talk about it in three ways, and I'll just take you through that. Um, most fundamentally, I think it's a partnership. Uh, we see D-groups as a, as a partnership of development organizations who collectively strive for international development and social justice. That's something that, that is at the, the basis of all our work. Um, and if you look at this slide here, you'll see some of the logos of some of the key partners. And you'll see that we have 15 full partners at the moment. Uh, we have nine associate partners. And we have just recently introduced a new category of project partners um, that we can talk about a little bit more. Overall, the D-Groups uh, um, partnership is, is managed by a foundation, the D-Groups Foundation. And it was established in 2009 in the Netherlands. Um, and as you see now, it comprises these different partner organizations. And the organizations really use uh, D-Groups to, to meet their need of, of having online groups to support their own work um, in terms of having communities, communities of practice, communities of information but also to commit to collaborating um, in development. So instead of having only in-house and internal systems, to really be using cross-organizational kind of communities of practice and foster collaboration across different organizations as well. You'll see these different membership options um, and the different fees that come with them and the different rights also, the, the different fees also come with different rights. Um, perhaps not to go into too much detail, but if anybody's interested in the differences between the different partnership options, then it's on the D-Group's information page, which we can share with you also uh, briefly after, after this uh, webinar. Um, but basically, what we all come together around is this D-Group's vision of a world where every person is able to contribute to dialogue and decision-making for international development and social justice. So that the, the spaces for dialogue and decision-making are opened up and information is shared much more broadly than in the silos, perhaps technical silos or organizational silos that exist within our sector. This is something that we all believe in and, and that we commit to by being part of the, of the partnership. A part of, apart from the partnership, and, and what you're probably most familiar with, is the platform um, that powers D-Groups. It's, in actual fact, it's a web-based platform, um, and it's hosted and maintained by WA Research in Switzerland. It's something, a platform that is that is recently being referred to as the community cloud. So you might be sometimes hear different words, the D-Groups platform, the WA Research platform, the community cloud platform, but basically there's one platform that's powering all of these groups uh, and all of this communication that's happening through the groups. Um, just to talk a little bit about the platform, at the moment there's 700, more than 700 communities, and they take different shapes, different forms, public or private, so closed or open to the public, moderated or unmoderated from many different sizes, some having thousands of members to very small working group type um, type groups of just a couple of people, really as, uh, as per the need um, for that particular group. Overall, there's almost 300,000 300, registered users on the D-Groups platform, again, differing from members of international organizations or government agencies, 
uh, to local and national level NGOs, interested individuals, professional groups that are making use of it, so a very diverse user base um, in all of these different communities. And the platform is actually enabling the delivery of, of more than 400,000 email messages daily. So this is really the, the power of the dgroups platform, as many of you will have uh, experienced, I think, as well, is that it really operates from uh, professionals' inboxes, so email inboxes. It doesn't require any sort of going to a web-based platform or commenting on, on threads that have, that have you know, multiple logins. It really comes into the user's individual inbox and, and operates from there. That's also key to its simplicity. Uh, we keep hearing this back from, from many of the user communities, is really that, it's, that it, it doesn't take any sort of technical knowledge to be able to engage in dialogue using, using these groups. It's multilingual. The user interface is available in English, in French, in Spanish, Portuguese, Chinese, and Russian. Uh, and perhaps also very importantly, you just use the tool in the language in which you are, you are hosting the dialogue. Um, it's flexible and scalable, um, so each dgroup workspace allows for customizable individual profile members, and they can be grouped by country or customizable email delivery preferences from, you know, from immediate delivery to daily delivery to weekly kind of summaries. There's basic stats tools, uh, basic usage reports, like we said before, open or closed groups. There's also RSS and API facilities to be able to integrate uh, a dgroup in uh, other web pages, for example. Uh, very importantly, also for many, it's non-commercial and it's respectful of privacy. So you might ask yourself, why don't we just go for a Google group or, I guess, formerly a, a Yahoo group? Um, and that's really one of the big reasons why people use dgroups as well, that it, it sits within our own servers. There's no advertising. There's no, the data isn't being shared with with third parties that are then using it for their purposes. Um, this is one of the, the very big reasons why people do go for the use of the dgroups platform. And because it's, uh, because it's really email focused, it can, it's used really to, to target especially low bandwidth users. And that's something that we really try and safeguard as all the technology developments go on so, so quickly, we really try and safeguard that it remains email as a core and a very light web-based interface just the, the essence and the, the essential functionalities. Um, so a partnership, uh, a web-based platform, and the third element that we use to talk about dgroups is that we see it as a global public good. We really see uh, uh, the partnership making the platform available to actors across the development sector and thereby um, hosting a large family of discussion groups related to international development. Um, which we really see as a strength and an, and an opportunity of dgroups. Um, so um, the focus, sorry, the focus then really is not about building fancy technology. And sometimes we'll get these questions, well, can dgroups do this? Can dgroups do that? And we're really trying to safeguard that it's not fancy technology, but that it really maintains what works and what is sustainable over time. Uh, not just in terms of financial sustainability, but also in terms of, and especially in terms of access and use. Um, we really try to see that it's effective and flexible, uh, that, that group administrators or list uh, administrators can focus on the content and don't need to spend time in answering technical questions, or um, that it really focuses on, on, on supporting a variety of organizational processes in terms of communication, collaboration, information sharing, so not to be too specific in its use application, but to really be able to provide a, gen a generic tool that meets many different needs. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I went offline for a little bit. Am I back? <laughs> yes, you're Thank back, you. Saskia. Yeah, if great. we can wrap up because we are running out of time. Yep, great. Um, 
So again, I mean, as part of the, the, the foundation and the partnership, we see a shared ownership of the dgroups platform. And our intention is really to contribute to reducing the duplication and fragmentation of online communities. So really trying to uh, encourage many different groups to join within this larger dgroups family. Um, and then much more importantly, so I hope that was useful as a, as a background, but more importantly, it'll be interesting to see how some of our key member organizations and partners are making use of the platform. Thank you. Thank you very much, Saskia. So let's move uh, quickly to your first uh, uh, case study. So I would like uh, to ask Suzanne to, uh, to unmute her microphone and uh, to start a presentation. So Suzanne will talk about the Global Food Farmer Field School platform uh, from FAO. Suzanne, the floor is yours, please. I cannot hear you, Suzanne. I don't know if other people can hear you. I can hear. Suzanne? Your microphone is uh, muted at the moment, so you Hi. can un unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes, please. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Okay, my name is Suzanne Phillips and I work at the Farmer Field School team of the Plant Crop Production Division of the FAO. And I will be presenting how the Farmer Field School team in FAO use D groups to connect the global and growing community of field school practitioners um, together. So, uh, yeah, through the D groups. And the context, just to give a bit of context on this approach, the Farmer Field School approach is a adult informal uh, education approach that uses learning by doing to empower farmers to understand their ecosystems and become decision makers in their own fields. Um, extension workers, farmer organization uh, staff and private, um, private company staff are trained as facilitators and then these facilitators help a group of farmers basically to experiment uh, on different practices throughout the cropping season. And this has different impacts uh, in terms of um, yield increase, uh, sustainability of practices, uh, gross margins that farmers make, and others. So basically, the approach was developed first by the FAO in 1989 in Indonesia with uh, rice growing farmers uh, to deal with some specific problems that these farmers had, and then they came together in a group to try and solve the problem. But since then, since 1989, the approach has expanded massively to over um, 100 countries, I would say, <laughs> out of, as of 2018, and it went from just looking at integrated pest management of uh, rice crop to a variety of crops, of production systems, and different problems, as you can see in, in the graph. And moreover, in, it's been taken up by a lot of other organizations outside of FAO, so IFAD, but also other NGOs, governments, and we estimate uh, that we have between 10 and 20 million farmers who have been trained, in addition to all these different type of stuff. So uh, different staff and extension people who have been trained. So this uh, ask, uh, created the question for FAO of how are we going to facilitate the quality of field school now that it is expanding so fast? Because what we see is that the quality of field school sometimes is not uh, the best and also that the efforts are duplicated. Um, so ha to answer this question, we decided last year to set up a global farmer field school platform uh, which would facilitate exchange of knowledge, expertise, and information among all the different practitioners, the community of practice of FFS, uh, help document and improve the visibility of achievements globally, and promote the quality of the field school through the harmonization and collaboration among the different people. So this meant, this platform, what it is, it is firstly a website. So it's an FAO website where we put together most of the documentation on FFS. Um, and expertise, so different type of people who have expertise. 
it's a network of partners, so you can see some organizations that have become, that are very involved in field schools and, and, and join the platform. And it's all the practitioners worldwide. Um, but in addition to being a website, we really also wanted a place, um, some way um, to connect and allow these different people to talk together and exchange together in a very dynamic way and without excluding certain people. So the ones who are further away, maybe the people who didn't very, have very good IT uh, internet access, uh, connection or skills. Um, so that's why uh, we used the D groups. Uh, we decided to use the D group to connect the community of practice, this global growing community of practice. And there is a screenshot here of our user base, let's say, so mostly in Africa and Asia. But actually, you can see that there is a big bubble on the bottom left, and that's all the people that are from countries, but they didn't say which countries they are from. So we have now actually about 1,000 members uh, since setting the D group up, and then they come from 106 countries, and they have been engaged in more than 117 discussions since setting up the group and contributing a lot um, in different ways. And they talked about a variety of things. Some of them, we were the ones asking them questions, such as on climate change, what do you do on climate change? And others, um, and then others were uh, discussions that started directly from the practitioners. And one of our, two of our successes is also that some of the people in the groups were policymakers doing publications on field school and they used the content of the discussions to create some, uh, some documentation like the ones that you can see in the slides. Uh, and then we also use um, these groups to uh, facilitate some webinars like the one we have now but on specific topics and reach all this diversity of actors who are involved in, in field schools. So to conclude, uh, we would really recommend using the D-Group. Uh, we found that it was very useful because um, it is free of charge for end users, so it doesn't exclude anyone. And it doesn't exclude anyone also because it doesn't require very um, uh, elaborated IT literacy. And uh, it doesn't require very strong uh, bandwidth uh, so it's easy to connect even if your connection is not so good. And we like the fact that it was email based, so you don't need to log in uh, somewhere and forget or remember your password, but you can receive all the notification directly on your mailbox. And then also from the administration point of view, administrator's point of view, it's very easy to moderate. Uh, yeah. So we were def definitely had a very positive experience using the D groups. And uh, it's probably the most dynamic part of our FFS platform at the moment, and it's growing more and more. So we're really happy with uh, being able to use this. Thank you. Thank you, Thank very, you much, very much, Suzanne. Suzanne. Very, very interesting, interesting presentation. presentation. Sorry, I'm muting you because we had a bit of an echo. Um, yeah, very, very interesting. Thanks a lot for, uh, for sharing this uh, uh, case study with us. So let's move uh, uh, to our next speaker. We've got Giacomo Rambaldi from CTA talking about uh, the drones for agriculture D-groups. Giacomo, the floor is yours. Uh, you have about six to seven minutes. Yeah, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, my name is Giacomo Rambaldi. I work for uh, CTA. And uh, I've been using uh, the platform, the D-group platform, for more than a decade now. Um, this is one of the D groups uh, uh, I'm uh, administering, and specifically, this uh, D groups uh, uh, deals with uh, drone technology for agriculture. These D groups uh, started about two years ago, and uh, one of the key uh, issues we uh, we came across when uh, starting to deal with the technology was that the adoption of the technology is heavily influenced by regulations. And uh, we did an assessment uh, <clears throat> across uh, Africa, Pacific, and Caribbean to find out that very few countries two years ago had uh, any regulation in place. Uh, several countries just uh, were forbidding the import and use of drones, um, lack of any 
any way to, to control their use. And uh, so we wanted to have a clearer idea on, on the situation. And uh, we, uh, we relied a lot on, on the members of the groups to, uh, to collect information. We were part also, this is the interface of the group. And this is one of the things you can, uh, you can do. You can customize the home page, uh, have welcome messages, and also uh, create dedicated URLs um, to, uh, to lead people, to funnel people uh, into the, into the D-groups. Uh, the D-groups we are managing, most of them are open groups. And I will talk about that later on, where people can, uh, uh, can, uh, can apply to become members. So uh, we, one of the objectives of that particular action within, within the group was to populate an online database. This was an effort done with a, with a number of development agencies. Uh, there were a few at that time, two years ago, there were a few databases existing uh, featuring uh, uh, legislations, featuring regulations uh, governing the use of drones. But uh, they were very scanty, non-updated. Non and so this platform was set up. Um, uh, and it is a Wikipedia-like platform with uh, individual uh, curators of national pages. And, uh, uh, so we, with members from more than 100 countries on the D-groups, we were able to uh, mobilize the whole community in coming up with information about uh, uh, national legislation. And this is the distribution of the, of the membership. And uh, these are some statistics. We are close to 1,000 members now. I'm, it's very similar to the previous presentation around covering around 100 countries. We had it about 1,000 contribution, and the, uh, the community has been growing very fast. We have also equivalent uh, communities on, uh, on other social media, uh, Twitter and, and Facebook. And, but this one is the, the, the group which has the most serious uh, discussion, where the discussions are really intensive, technical, and, uh, and uh, looking at uh, legal aspects uh, where, where, the, where the members are engaging much more than on, uh, on, uh, on Facebook. Facebook, it's just, we just share information. We just share um, activities which are done here and there. And Twitter, it's a, a news bulletin, more or less, while the real discussion happens on, on, on D group. Now, uh, why, why D groups? I think that my colleagues have have already uh, flagged some of the of the positive sides of new groups. Um, I, I won't repeat everything. I'm mean, just going to to highlight the privacy aspect. I think that uh, uh, what what uh, is featured in the news in these days with the, this breach uh, at at, at, face, at Facebook. I mean. Um, D groups is really private. There is no parsing of content to serve you advertisements. There is no profiling of members, and nobody uh, is going to, to 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 harvest what you say, what you think, and who you are to make uh, other use of of, of that information. Um, what is Im important for the administrators is that you can uh, easily customize the the groups. You can uh, define whether a group is moderated or not, whether it is visible uh, or not on, on the web. Um, and then one thing which was not mentioned is that you can create sub-communities. So for example, we have a sub-community uh, on, 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 uh, on the group dealing with drones, which is geographically defined. Another one may be thematically defined, and so on. Um, well, uh, commonly at CTA, we use D groups um, when we have projects. When, for example, when we organize a conference, we can create a, um, a number of D groups uh, because you have working groups who are participating in the organization of, of an event. And, uh, and this, this kind of working groups are um, usually private uh, by invitation only. They are non-moderated, so uh, the postings are going through immediately. And they die out when the event has been uh, uh, completed. But still, you can, uh, since you can upload documents, uh, they can still be um, a repository of, of information and exchanges. Uh, 
what we also use dgroups for are to create, animate, and nurture communities of practice. These are usually public. Uh, usually we moderate these communities because when you have 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 people, you don't want to have somebody writing, hello, how are you, and uh, let's keep in touch, and so on, because these kind of messages are quite disruptive. Uh, and here in these kind of uh, communities, we accept unsolicited application, but they are reviewed by the moderators. Um, well, uh, I think Saskia mentioned that there is a website where you can get more information on dgroups. Here is the URL, and I invite everybody to, to look into that, because dgroups is a real uh, powerhouse for communication and exchange in the development work. Thank you very much to everybody. I did seven minutes, point zero four seconds. Thank you, Giacomo. Fantastic. You time yourself. And yes, perfect, perfect timing. Thanks very much, uh, not only, of course, for sticking to time, but also for your, the great insights you share with us. Um, yes, we have dgroups.team for here. We'll share some more information by the end of the webinar uh, on where you can learn more about dgroups, find some case studies, learn how to uh, set up a communities or some also tips and tricks how to make your conversations uh, more uh, to, to encourage participation in conversations. Um, I see a lot of uh, happening also in the chat. Please keep your questions coming over there as we go to our um, last speaker for this webinar. So we have Neil uh, from uh, HIFA, Healthcare Information for All. Neil, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Pierre. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Yes, please go um, ahead. This is the last, excellent, this is the last presentation. Um, and uh, so I'm Neil Packenham Walsh, and I am the coordinator of Healthcare Information for All. And I'm also currently the chair of the D Groups Foundation. Uh, I'm based in the UK near Oxford. And uh, over the next few minutes, I'll I'll tell you a little bit about healthcare information for all and why dgroups is so important to us. Uh, you'll see here I've, I'm calling healthcare information for all a global community of purpose. And we define this as a virtual community of practice where everyone is working together towards a common goal. And I think that dgroups uniquely has the functionality and the enabling environment to make this possible. The, the issue that we are trying to solve with dgroups, um, and particularly with the, the HIFA campaign, is the pervasive problem that people are dying for lack of knowledge. I'll just describe this very briefly to say why we, this is why we exist. Because in the next five minutes while I'm talking, there will be another 50 five zero children will die because they are not given simple life-saving interventions like antibiotics for pneumonia or sugar salt solution for acute diarrhea. Most of these deaths are in sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. And there are an unknown number of premature deaths in adults also, which relates again to failure to provide life-saving treatments. Now, tragically, these treatments are actually often locally available, but they're simply not provided due to lack of access to basic healthcare knowledge and information. So HIFA is aiming all of us towards a future where every person will have access to the healthcare information they need to protect their own health and the health of others. They, when we launched HIFA in 2006, uh, we had a letter of support from the World Health Organization that said healthcare information for all is an ambitious goal, but it can be achieved if all stakeholders work together. And I think that dgroups is the best approach that I know of to bring stakeholders together around a complex development or health challenge. And we've been using it successfully for more than 10 years. So we launched in 2006 in Mombasa <clears throat> with a small grant from the British Medical Journal. 
we use an approach to moderation called reader-focused moderation, and I put a message in the chat box because someone was asking about moderation techniques. So reader-focused moderation is one technique that we use, and it focuses on meeting the needs of readers of messages. So every message that goes out on HIFA should be relevant and understandable. And if there are any queries, then the moderator deals with the author before the message is posted. So also, every message includes the author's profile underneath it. So you always know when and where he or she is coming from. Our approach was, it has been firstly to agree and define the goal. And I think this is important to, if you have a community of purpose, then you need to get a degree of set consensus about what the purpose of the community is all about. And then ever since then, it's, it's exploring the many aspects of how to improve availability and use of healthcare information. And indeed, many other related aspects of improving quality of care, uh, achieving the Sustainable Development Goal 3, achieving universal health coverage, and so on. And in, in order to do this, to build a critical mass so that we can advocate for um, better financial and political support for health information provision and use. So the result is that we now have, in fact, we've just topped more than 18,000 members now. Um, we get about six or seven new members joining every day. The chart on the right-hand side is the growth chart. So you can see that we've, we're, we're um, expanding rapidly and without, at the moment, any slow up in the growth. We now have five D groups, and you can see the logos of the D groups. So we've got HIFA, CHIFA, which are both in English. Then we have HIFA in Portuguese, HIFA in French, and then we have one country uh, level HIFA, HIFA Zambia. We ha have 300 supporting organizations that have um, officially declared their support for the HIFA vision. Uh, we are funded by 40 different organizations, and we're ru currently running 12 projects, including, for example, uh, looking at the information needs of community health workers, the information needs of citizens, the information needs of policymakers, and then health-specific um, projects such as family planning with support from k for health of the Johns Hopkins University. Our main strategic partner is the World Health Organization, and we have uh, four staff of the World Health Organization on our steering group. And our main funding partner is the British Medical Association. This is a slide just to show all of the organizations that are currently supporting HIFA financially in 2018. And uh, I draw your attention to the number 50K at the top hand right. That is the total amount that we have uh, raised for our work this, this year. So in other words, you can achieve a, an awful lot with a very small amount of money. Um, we had an external evaluation, a major external evaluation done in 2011, which concluded that HIFA achieves an extraordinary level of activity on minimal resources from which many people around the world benefit. And I emphasize that none of this would have been possible without D-groups. Finally, why would we recommend D-groups to others? Firstly, it simply works. Uh, the Community Cloud, which is the software that D-groups runs on, works better than any other tool for communities of practice. Secondly, as Saskia has said, it's a partnership of United Nations agencies, bilateral agencies, and NGOs. And we are all committed to international development, human rights, and social justice. I would add that, essentially, 
Dgroup's 300,000 users are primarily driven by wanting to create a better world. And this is really in stark contrast to the social media giants like Facebook or Google. So in conclusion, we are um, grateful for the community cloud software and for the enabling environment of dgroups. And if I might say a word in my role as chair of dgroups, we are keen to expand the partnership and we look forward to welcoming new partners. Thanks. Thank you very much, Neil. Again, excellent presentation. And yeah, I think the, um, especially nowadays, uh, it's very relevant your mentioning of Facebook and everything that's going on um, with that in terms of privacy and, and data and how dgroups compares to to that. Um, so we are now with you now but about 20 minutes for discussion. Uh, discussion is already happening in the chat, as you all can see. Um, but let's try to um, to bring some of your questions back to the panel. Alice, um, I'm handing over to you to just uh, tell us how we're going to run this this part. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so uh, for the q and I have already taken note of the questions in the chat and we will take uh, a few of them uh, first to start with. Uh, but would you like to take the floor and activate your microphone? You can do that uh, by uh, first raising your hand um, using the little icons on the top of your screen as you can see on the slide. Here is an icon you can use to raise your hand and then we will give you the floor and you will have to activate your microphone by clicking on the little icon uh, of the microphone. So uh, first I will uh, already group a few questions from the chat and in the meanwhile you can think of your questions, raise your hand or either uh, continue using the chat uh, for your questions. So first of all, I see in the chat that there is still a lot of questions on how to set up a D groups. So I would uh, like to ask uh, to our panel to see if we can briefly explain again how D group works, what it is exactly, and what you have to do to set up a D groups. So uh, related to the partnership on one side but then on the other side also, what would the technical steps be to do this? So uh, if someone can uh, take the floor from the panel uh, to uh, go back uh, to uh, this uh, set of questions, that would be great. Pierre Andrea uh, will answer this for you. Thanks, Alice. Uh, yes, I saw that also Neil prompted me to to answer this question. So um, just to keep it brief, and then we can send more detailed information uh, as a fo in the follow-up email. Uh, creation of D groups uh, is uh, um, possible for partners, right? We saw uh, before in uh, Saskia's slides, D groups is a partnership of different organization. When organization join, when an organization join D groups, they can create any limited number of groups uh, for their, their themselves and the project they work with, right? So in order to be able to create a group, uh, you need to be part of the partnership. And there are different uh, um, membership options. Um, the, inter the technicalities of creating a group, uh, it's really, really simple. It takes literally 30 seconds. You just decide the name of the group, uh, you decide uh, an email address for your group, and off you go. So technically, it's really, really simple. Uh, but yes, in order to be able to create a group, you need to be part of the partnership. And we will send information about that afterwards. OK, thank you, Pierre-Andrea. So links will be shared in the follow-up email. I see that Saskia, Saskia has already has just shared the link and now to join, so you can find more information. Yeah, thank you. Um, a few more questions uh, from uh, the chat that uh, would uh, be good to 
to bring uh, in this discussion uh, for everybody who misses uh, some parts of the chat. Uh, I think that um, it's interesting to go to the question on the monitoring and evaluation capabilities of a D group. Uh, what is available and, and how can it be used? Uh, so I see we have Suzanne raising her hand, so Suzanne, maybe you want to take this. I can also share a couple of points here, but yeah, Suzanne, over to you. Okay, I'll just say what I know and you complete. I think there's some automatically, so I'm not sure whether that's clear, but basically the D-group, there's a website that then, I mean, a web page that then is linked to whichever email address you set for your D-group. And on that page, you can see a record of all the discussions a description of which are the members that are there, and then some administration moderation facilities. And then some statistics. So basically, automatically you have statistics on who are the members and where they're from, and how many have joined over a certain period of time, and contributions. So how many contributions by which country over which period of time. So this is the main statistics at least I use, but I let it over to Pierre Andrea if there's more. Uh, yes, thanks very much, Suzanne. Indeed, the stats page uh, was recently redeveloped, so you can see quite uh, a wealth of information in terms of membership and contributions, contributions by country, and so on. Uh, I see that both uh, uh, Giacomo and Pat uh, have their hand raised. Uh, Giacomo, would you like to comment on statistics? Um, I think uh, you yeah. raised your hand for that. Yes, um, one of the features you can activate <clears throat> in the back end is that uh, you, you make it mandatory for new registrants to fill in uh, their data. Uh, now, you saw on one of the presentations a big uh, circle. Uh, these, are pe these were people who didn't specify the country they are residing in, and this is uh, something we, we would like to avoid because um, creating uh, on D groups, you can cluster uh, the members by country, and uh, so, for example, uh, on, in the case of the drone, uh, the, the community dealing with drones, if somebody wants to know who uh, who is a, a drone operator or who, deal, who is interested in drones in Nigeria, he can do that and can see exactly who is uh, based in the country. Now that. Uh, action is not possible if the members didn't specify which country they are coming from. And uh, in the back end, you can activate this function, uh, obliging people on registration to fill in all a basic number of data. Thanks very much, Giacomo. Thanks very much. And yes, you can also export your list of members, and the export will also show uh, the date when they have joined, so you can also chart that to produce some some graph. I see there are more questions, but before we go to Ibrahim, uh, Pat, you have your hand raised for a while now, so uh, would you like to try and activate your mic and um, ask your question? You need to make to click on the mic microphone, Pat, uh, to make sure the microphone is on green. At that point, you will yeah. be able to speak. I think yes. the microphone is on Please green. Go. I hope you can hear me. Thank you very much, and thank you for the brilliant presentations. Uh, we're just in the early stages of setting up uh, D Group's uh, network, focusing on the health of the nursing workforce globally. And my question is really, I guess, to the presenters. At what point did they decide to have subgroups? Um, the issue that we're looking at, nurses' health, is very complex. It's an issue in every country, but the specifics are quite different. And in order to engage the network, the community, um, we don't want people to get bored because the issue that's being discussed is not of relevance to them. But neither do we want to split the group into subgroups too quickly because we're at the very early stages. So I guess my question is, how do you keep people engaged even when their specific issue might not be attracting much discussion? Thank you. Very good question. Uh, anybody from our panel would like to answer Thanks. that? 
and there is also yes, another question that, that came into that, that came into the chat uh, regarding uh, uh, accessibility of the groups. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, uh, can, how can people participate? Uh, um, and uh, uh, yeah, what uh, what are uh, the needs there? So Neil, uh, over to you to answer to Pat's question. Yes, thanks very much. Uh, well. From the experience of HIFA English, which has uh, over 10,000 members, uh, we have not yet found a need to have sub-communities, although we are starting to discuss it as it becomes bigger and bigger. Um, the important thing, I think, with for the reader is that they are able to identify easily those messages that are relevant to their needs, uh, and but also to be able to see other discussions and other subjects that may be going on that may actually uh, be of, of, of interest to them. And the best way to, to handle this is through ensuring that the subject line, in other words, the, the line that you see in your email inbox, um, that that is as uh, valuable to the end user as possible in terms of showing what is underneath, so to speak. And one of the func one of the functionality points of dgroups is that it is possible for the moderator to um, edit the subject line so that it accurately reflects the content of the message. Now, another thing is that we have uh, the default set setting for HIFA English is that each member receives all the messages from the previous 24 hours as a digest, as a compilation um, each day. And so they receive only one email per day. And at the top of the message, there is the list of usually about seven or eight subject lines that refer to the content underneath. And so again, that makes it easy for people to, to tell how thing, uh, tell immediately from that a glance whether there's anything that is going to be of interest to them. But certainly, there is a, there is a case for having separate D groups for, um, for diff different uh, topics. But there is also a case for having sub-communities of D-groups. And I understand that some partners, such as um, FARA, I know the, the uh, Rural Water Supply Network, I believe, with uh, Sean Fury, has very successfully uh, done a lot, done used sub-communities in, in their uh, D-groups work. And indeed, there's a case study that Saskia and Sean worked on together on the dgroups.info website to explain how they did it. Thank you very much, Neil. I see that Giacomo has uh, his hand raised. I don't know if it's from before or you would like to comment on the use of sub-communities, Giacomo. No, no, I want to comment on, on this point. Uh, at CTA, uh, we use sub-communities mainly uh, when organizing large, large events. And for example, you have a communication group, you have a marketing group, you have different groups. So they are all, everybody's part of the main discussion, but uh, specific discussions are conducted, focused discussion are, are conducted on, on the, on the sub-communities. One thing which is very important, and this is uh, quite uh, uh, helpful in D-groups, is that uh, every email which is coming from a specific group has uh, in square brackets uh, uh, the acronym of the group. And if you use, for example, Outlook, you can create a rule, and then the emails are automatically sorted and filtered according to the, to the rule you create, and it's very easy to create that, so that uh, you can refer to, um, to the content of the discussion just going to the folder which contains all the, all the emails. And if you have sub subgroups, each subgroup which will have its own um, uh, ident unique identifier, and this helps in sorting out uh, the, um, the, the correspondence, the incoming correspondence. I'm done. Thanks, Giacomo. 
Uh, yeah, I, my experience is very similar to you, uh, especially for large events or large projects. It's very useful to have to have subgroups. Uh, there was a question about from Ibrahim about uh, uh, security and how can other individuals access content of the discussion from D groups? How secure our content from e eavesdropping? Um, anybody from our panel would like to take this question? Um, Maybe Neil or, or Saskia. Otherwise, I'm also happy to comment um, very briefly, and then we can follow. Yeah, Giacomo, please go ahead. Well, I think it's the responsibility of the moderator, of, of the administrator, to check who is uh, applying to, to register. If you have a suspicious uh, email address, um, you may want to do some, some check. Um, and if you see that uh, somebody who registered is trying to spam and the group is moderated, you can immediately um, delete that profile and block that person. Um, now, of course, you can have somebody uh, who registers to harvest information on the, on the list. Uh, uh, but as, a, as an administrator, you can uh, define whether members can see the email or the details of the other members uh, or not. So this is a decision which is taken um, at the level of, of administration uh, of the group. Um, yeah, that, that this is what I could contribute. Thanks, Giacomo. Just to add on it, um, the D-Groups D is hosted uh, uh, by WA Research, which is based in Switzerland. So information sits on server in secure location in Switzerland. Personally, I never had issues of uh, uh, D-Groups being targeted by spammers or phishing. I had recently this bad experience with Google Groups. Uh, we were using, for a different project, Google Groups uh, uh, G Suite, so the paid version of Google Groups. At a certain point, the groups were exposed, and uh, they were targeted to, from the, by, by phishing um, messages. Um, we never had this experience with the groups touching wood. Uh, so in general, yes, uh, information is stored in secure location. It's not shared with third parties. And I think it's very important, especially, like I said, nowadays, with all that we hear on the news about Facebook and the like. Um, do we have any more? We have a couple more minutes uh, um, before the official ending time of the webinar. Alice, is there any other question that, uh, that we've missed from the chat or anybody else uh, in our list of participants that would like to raise his or her hand uh, and um, come in uh, with voice? I see, Pat, uh, your question about encouraging engagement. Uh, uh, we'll share some resources about that. This is not the topic of this webinar. We ran a series of webinars a couple of years back around engagement. Of course, yeah, it's, uh, it's the key. Um, we can point you to those resources. And if you're interested, we can try also to organize follow-up webinars that focus on how to drive engagement in the groups communities. Alice, uh, you were about to say something, and I see also Saskia with the hand raised. So Alice and then Saskia. I was just going to point to this question about engagement because it came up uh, uh, several times, and I agree that this is something we can address more specifically uh, afterwards with resources. So give the floor to. Thank you. Mine is quite different. I saw a question early on. I can't remember exactly who posted it. Uh, somebody asked what the difference, whether there was a difference between D groups and the Knowledge Gateway. I thought that was a, a good question to ask, and I just want to clarify to the extent that I know. Um, both D groups and the Knowledge Gateway make use of the same platform, so the same community cloud platform. Um, they have a, a social, uh, international development focus, with the Knowledge Gateway being more focused on health. The difference, as far as I know, but maybe Neil and Pierre-Andrea can add uh, if useful, is that the Knowledge Gateway is actually not a partnership 
So um, it's not open to other organizations joining and collectively making use of what we call this public good quality groups. So if you are looking for online communities, it's actually not possible for you to join the Knowledge Gateway. The Knowledge Gateway has very interesting and relevant communities hosted on it, but it's not an opportunity for you to have your own kind of subspace within the D-Groups partnership to facilitate your own community needs. Um, so the platform is the same, the approach is slightly different, and D-Groups really tries to bring together anybody who's interested in using the tool uh, for development purposes. Thanks. Thanks, Saskia. Um, Neil, over to you. Thanks, yes, just to, thanks, Saskia. Just to add to that, um, just a slight clarification. Uh, when we talk about the same platform, we're really actually talking about the same underlying software. So the platform dgroups.org uh, is, if you like, the dgroups platform. And the underlying software that we use is called Community Cloud. And it, it is indeed the same software that the Knowledge Gateway uses. The Knowledge Gateway has been around for as long, if not longer, than um, dgroups. And it is particularly focused on health and indeed um, primarily, I think, on uh, reproductive health. They do, it is, um, I'm not, I don't have any details on ha how it is set up exactly. I don't, it doesn't have the same, um, foundation status, formal foundation status as dgroups has, but I do understand that there are several organizations, including the World Health Organization and the Johns Hopkins uh, CCP, the communication program, uh, that um, collaborate to use it. And it does, like dgroups, it does have um, several uh, communities of practice. Thanks for the clarification, Neil. Uh, we are running out of time. Maybe we have qu uh, time for one last question. I see that Ibrahim has raised his hand. So Ibrahim, would you like to come in with voice? Uh, we'll take this one as last question or comment, and then we're going to wrap up. Ibrahim, you should activate your microphone, so you should click on the microphone icon to turn it to green. And at that point, OK, I see your chat now. You don't have any further question. Um, so it's now uh, 2 past uh, uh, 5, I guess, uh, in Rome. Um, I think we should uh, probably wrap up. Uh, I see that there are a few questions and comments still coming onto uh, the chat. Uh, we might uh, leave the, the room open for a few more minutes after um, the webinar is over, just to uh, allow for further networking and exchange. But I think uh, we are going to close uh, the official part of the webinar here. So I would like to thank our presenters, uh, Suzanne, Saskia, Neil and Giacomo for the um, great presentation and case studies that you share with us. And of course, Alice from FAO for uh, keep us, uh, keeping us running uh, very smoothly. Um, as Alice mentioned, in the follow-up email, uh, we'll share the webinar recordings, we'll share the slides, and we'll share the links uh, uh, and additional information that might be useful. Uh, you have some contact details here on the slide uh, if you want to get in touch with us, so digicoordination at dgroups.org and the website dgroups.info for more information. I think from my side it's all. Thanks again for joining us and again thanks to all our presenter and our host. Thank you very much.